We are at week number four of our Bible reading, and so for the month of May, that means we're trying to do something with Romans, figure out how to make it uh, relevant and applicable. And And I think the interesting thing about Romans is that for a book that largely is this really high-level theological essay, at least it seems that way on the surface sometimes, yeah. there are there are some really great dramatic applications, I think, to be found. Well, yeah for disciples every day, and that relate to very real struggles. Because after all, uh, one of the things I think we'll see by the time we're done with all these letters from Paul is that things don't change that much. No, no, The struggles of one generation just uh, come back in another and a little bit different variety, but still fundamentally the same struggles. That's right. The world is still full of sin, Romans 1 through 3. The answer (laughs) is still Jesus Christ and faith in him, Romans 4 through 8. So we just read 1 and 2 Corinthians. Yeah. and, And typically... We identify, you know, you know, Corinth as a troubled church, divided, right. needed unity. But I, th- I think Rome, Rome is too. Yeah. And uh, the other interesting thing about that is that all throughout the New Testament, you have this this fracture line between Jew and Gentile. Right. And how many of these letters, in some form, is that playing out? Trying to uh, trying to bring together these divided people. Right. And uh, the curious thing to me is. Uh, that we deal with the same thing today. Right. And, and not just the obvious stuff. Obviously, we see uh, a divide between black and white in our culture, and then some of the other cultures uh, factor in with their own issues with other cultures and things like that, other races. We're still naturally, you know, humans naturally in their sin divide I yeah. mean, and, and separate, look down at the other. Um, yeah, nothing changes. Yeah, we've been, <laughs> the history of man is we have been trying to pull ourselves apart from each other while God has been striving to, to bring us together. And it isn't just, but it's just along racial lines. I think that if you really dug into the hearts of men, there's an intellectual divide between the educated and the uneducated. Rich and poor. There's a financial divide yeah. between those who have a lie and those who don't. There are there are geographical divides. Yeah. I mean, people in the st- South till still talk about the people in the North. And we know y'all talk about us too, so don't be getting prideful about that. <laughs> Romans deals with that. And none of us even know what to do with California. It's kind of its own unique geographical problem with the rest of the nation. But um, but one of the things I, I love about the early chapters of this book is, is something I don't think we see when we study them. And that is how ultimately what Paul is saying in the first three, three chapters is this powerful mechanism for uniting everybody. Yeah, yeah, but it's ironic. It is ironic because because the first three chapters are really uh, leading up to the, the the climactic point in chapter three where he says everybody sins, right? Fall short of the glory, yeah, falls and, short of the glory of God, and that you know that's the end of the argument. They start developing <clears throat> chapter one, which is for the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteous, and so the thing that unites us is. You know, without the gospel, we are all under the wrath of God. I mean, there's your... <laughs> yeah, but you know by the end of chapter 1 that the Jews... I, I imagine Romans being read in the church at Rome yeah. with this... With these racial tensions. With these racial there. tensions. And by the time they get to that part toward the end of chapter 1, the Jews are sitting there smugly saying, yes, yes yeah. go go get them. And it's almost like Paul anticipates that because he's it, it, it gets into chapter 2 and he's like, what are you guys being so haughty about? Yeah. And then he, and then he takes out the Jews and, and calls them out. You know, yeah. you're not even keeping this law you came to you right. know, come. You claim is so important to you, right? And by the way, that makes you worse actually because you did have the law. Yeah. You know, God talked talked to you and told you exactly what He wanted, unlike the Gentile. And so, who are you? They had advantages they didn't take advantage. That's exactly of. what but, He says. But but the curious thing is, I think we don't appreciate how ultimately these rather negative three chapters. Yeah have this unifying capacity in, in this way. We talked about this a little last week. The way it brings people together is that it brings us all down to the same place. Yeah. Because I think in culture, we have this desire to sort of uh, categorize ourselves uh, in a way that's better than somebody else. So surely the Jews did that with the Gentiles. Um, you know, They were these godless pagans, and we are the people, the covenant people, We've had the laws of God all down through time. It just naturally makes us better than than the Gentile world is. Well, we do the, the same thing. That's the key is, you know, then now we tend to, in our, at least in our minds, create ways of ranking ourselves better or, or, or our group better than, you know, everybody else. 
And Paul says that's a fool's game in Romans 1 because all have sin. And I think, and I think living in an exceptionally corrupt culture, we're even more inclined to do that because we look around at what's going on with, 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 with divorce and adultery and, uh, and transgenderism and homosexuality. And we look at all that scandal. And listen, Paul's clear at the end of chapter 1. I mean, it, it's just scandalous behavior. Right. It's anti-creation right. behavior. I think uh, yeah, you'd you. like that when I say you. that. Echoes of Genesis and all of it that. It is. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I think we do the same thing. We, we look at our world and say, yeah, and I have my flaws. Right, but I'm not them. But I am not that. Yeah. And, and almost an entitlement mentality. Yeah, that's right. I think accompanies that. And so what he does, if you really pay attention to the chapters, uh, I think they, they, all of us get a smackdown. Yeah, and and what God does, or what Paul does, uh, God does through Paul, is he he deposits all of us at the foot of the cross. Well, that's it. Because at the end of the day, you know, I'm you know, if I'm not you know physically decadent in sexual immorality in Romans one, then Paul reminds you to Romans two. Yeah, but let's talk about your worship. You know, <laughs> let's talk about your you know you can get you can get there are so many ways to fall short of the glory of God. That we need to all be humble and say, I may not be them, but I am still this. So, the, or I still struggle with this. You know, the cool thing about that is, is that when I get who I am, then uh, you know the the millionaire can go plop himself down next to the guy that throws trash for a living. Absolutely, and 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 realize, in the only way that really matters, he and I are exactly the same. Yep, we're sinners. Pleading for mercy, but, at the foot of but the cross. by the grace of God, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so you might in this last week we have in Romans consider reading back through those three chapters, and instead of thinking about the Jew Gentile, think about us, yeah, and in our temptation to arrogance, in our self righteousness, and the need to be really careful about that, yeah. and to see the sameness that characterizes all of humanity. And that's the thing, David. I think anybody who uses Scripture, whether it's a prosperity preacher or somebody who's just trying to make, you know, kind of trying to cherry pick scripture and make it, you know, kind of help you have, you know, your just a better day or, you know, or, or, or whatnot. At the end of the day, what scripture keeps on bringing us back to is we need to look at the world through the lens of sin and God's righteousness, sin and salvation. You know, those who have not experienced God's grace and those that have, and those are the categories that we need to learn to look at the world through and look at our own lives through. And and that's the real struggle. The real struggle is not, you know, my my financial struggle or anything else. These are the categories, sin and righteousness, you know, grace and forgiveness versus rebellion against God. What a different perspective that is, because and that's now, what this book is for. Now the, the 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 unity piece of this is I'm bound together with everybody else. That's right. Who has de, de, who has had faith in Jesus, dependent on Jesus for right. salvation. Right. And and I have pity toward the people who haven't found that yet. And I think that's really important because I think we're too inclined to look down our noses at the world and say, you know, like the, like the prideful Pharisee, at least I'm not like that guy. Yeah. Least, but, but what I really need to be doing is, you know, I've really been where he is. Yeah. Because I've been at the foot of the cross begging for mercy, and he needs to be there too. Well, and, and, and the, just like that one step further from the book of Romans itself, a part we haven't really focused on any of the other weeks so far, but at the very beginning of Romans 9, when you understand these are the stakes and these are the only real ways of looking at humanity, not through racial or economic or, or any other lens, sinner and, and saved. I mean, those are the only two ways to look at people, and those are the only things that really matter you know, then it gives you an earnest concern for those who are not saved. You know, I think about Paul beginning of Romans 9 when he was thinking about his fellow Jews who weren't coming to God through Jesus Christ. You know, and literally, you know, I could wish myself accursed. You know, he literally talks about if God would take the trade, I'd go to hell to save the rest of them. Mm. That is just such a staggering display of his earnestness. He understands the enormity of what it means to face the wrath of God unprepared. Yep. And and he so desperately wants to see people say, not not make their life in this world easier. He understands what the stakes are, and it motivates him. Here, your two categories are interesting. I heard someone say one time, I can't remember who it was, uh, about the Titanic, that uh, on that ship you had uh, people who classified themselves in all kinds of ways. Yeah, there were the right. upper class, very wealthy, and there were the lower class who were who were 
riding along downstairs, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and there were all kind of races and all kinds of nationalities and educated and uneducated. Uh, but by the time it was all over, yeah. there were only two lists. Yeah. A list of those who were safe. Yeah. And a list of those who were not. And that, that seems like 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 life on earth is that way. Yeah. At the end of the day, however we categorize ourselves, there are two lists. Very much. The lost and the safe. Um, let's move on to Romans 12. Uh, that seems like such a natural place to go yeah. for applications. Cause, <laughs> the you know, beginning of it. You know, well, for the beginning, and I, Jeff and I have said to you that, that, that there are basically these two big segments right. of the book. There is this thing we right. call the essay, right or wrong, which, <laughs> which, which lays out Paul's argument. Right. Salvation is only by faith in, in Jesus. Right. And, uh, and, then, and then what we've been saying is at 12, he kind of plugs in the essay and and work some application. That might be a way to read it this week to to see how salvation being only by faith in Christ influences what he goes on to say. But just to deal with the opening language that I think is really familiar with us. I think that well, yeah. this is not an uncommon text to use in sermons. Um, I do think sometimes we don't spend enough time on the mercies of God. Yep. We talk a lot about being a living sacrifice, which is a beautiful figure, but it's rooted in the therefore. The verse begins with right. connecting to what's come, right? And then the mercies of God, which seem to me to be the essay, isn't it? Right. And and I think that that's very much you know he's appealing back to what he said earlier in the essay part, right? When he talks about you know scarcely would somebody die for a wicked man, you might die for a good man, you know, and you might scarcely die for a friend, but the point is Jesus died for sinners and enemies. And so, you know, that's, I think, what he's echoing, you know, that kind of a mentality. He starts talking about the mercies of God. Do you understand how far God has gone despite what we are in our sin and our rebelliousness? Yes. So, therefore, if God has shown this kind of a grace, this kind of a mercy, it really ought to motivate those who claim to be his people, because at that point he's talking to Christians, to truly present ourselves back. I mean, you know, the, the, that mercy of God are the motivate you know not just be an example but a motivation and and not just to tweak your schedule on Sunday that's exactly all right, right. I'll show up for sim- assemblies yeah. but but the language he uses here I think is dramatic to present yourself as a sacrifice yeah. to God you you your your life has no other purpose or meaning beyond this self offering to God which makes sense again elsewhere in the essay chapter six you're either a slave to sin, or you're a slave to, but but you are a slave to something. That's, that's the other figure. So yeah. think about that: slave and sacrifice. Right. Uh, a slave is someone who doesn't have his own rights. That's right. He belongs to another. That's right. And and so and the interesting thing to me in chapter six is that that what he argues is everyone has a master. You Correct. just you decide. Who Even, you, you're never free. You just who you, think who you want your master to be. But 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 to me, it answers this pushback of some disciples who. Who don't like the rule? Sometimes I've heard people say, "Yeah, I'm I, listen. I want to serve Jesus, but but not if it means I have to do that." It, it, the problem is not that someone would have the gall to object. Right. It's that they have no sense of who they are. That's right. That's it's, right. It's like God has done me this favor, and 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 so I'll I'll put in a little time for Him, not realizing the the, the story to me in the Gospels that encapsulate this is the rich young ruler. Yeah. Because it comes to Jesus, and he says, "I've been a good guy." Yeah. And Jesus says, "Great." I want you. Here's what it costs. Everything. Yeah, that's right. And what was he calling him to be? A slave of righteousness, yeah. a living sacrifice. And he said, yeah, I'll keep some rules, but I don't want to go that far. Yeah. And that's the thing, David. I think all of us, and it's different for each of us, but all of us have certain aspects of obedience to Jesus that are easier than others. But all of us have those commandments that get too close to home that touch on what's still an idol in our lives that we do not want to relinquish. Mm, you like that phrase. Well, because I think we're all, you know, as, as someone else wants, I mean, we're all idolaters at heart. The question is, do you know what yours is and have you gotten rid of it? That's yeah, the thing you get mad about, right? It's what you get really mad about or really <laughs> upset about when someone tries to talk to you about it, you know? And, and the reason you can't just let it go is because it hits too close to home. You know, there's plenty of things that, you know, people can say to us where we just kind of, you know, we let it roll off us, whatever. The reason we get angry or upset is because that one hit too close to home. We only get upset or, or you know, or angry about things that really matter to us, that we, I, that we define ourselves by. 
And so, uh, yeah. I think this segment is worth a more careful read uh, this week, uh, especially doing what you always urge us to do, Jeff, and that is knitting this together with the essay. You can't ignore that phrase, the mercies of God, yeah. because it's what it's what's defining then what ought to be our response to that. And so it would be a good thing to ponder in this last week we're spending in the book. Let it speak to you personally and to me personally. Am I presenting myself to God as that living sacrifice? Or am I hanging on like the rich young of the rulers to some idols that are holding me back? That'll be a good thing to ponder as we spend our time one more week in the book of Romans.